Welcome to Great Loop Radio, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. This is Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today's podcast is going to be a little bit longer than we typically do, and that's because we've decided to release the audio from the best of the loop presentation that I delivered during our virtual spring rendezvous. So you'll be hearing some of the frequently asked questions about the great loop and some of the details about the requirements on the boat and the places that you'll go. And then we'll transition into showing you what our members have rated as the best of along the way. So things like the best cities, the best festivals, the best historic sites. So we hope you enjoy this somewhat unique version of the great loop radio podcast. We're going to start with our message from one of our sponsors, and then we will jump right into the presentation itself. And while we're talking about it, I do want to take a moment, as I always do, to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes & Associates, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. And right after this message, you will hear the best of the loop presentation. Thanks for joining us. Curtis Stokes and Associates is a yacht brokerage company that specializes in great loop capable boats. Curtis Stokes is a supporter of AGLCA at the Admiral level. If you're looking to buy or sell a great loop veteran from a trusted and knowledgeable broker, visit the company on the web at curtisstokes.net, email curtis at curtisstokes.net, or call 855 266 Five six seven six. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first ever AGLCA Virtual Spring Rendezvous. Uh, welcome. My name is Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. For those of you that I haven't met, um, this is it's so just crazy that we're still sitting here doing this virtually. Um, if we were in person, the Spring Rendezvous would be happening in Norfolk, Virginia, right now. Tonight would be night number two. And about a year ago, the spring 2020 uh, rendezvous was the first large scale event that we actually had to cancel due to COVID. Um, we never dreamed that would happen and we never dreamed that a full year later, here we would still be doing these virtually. So um, if you recall way back to last year, we did consider doing a virtual spring rendezvous in 2020. It was about a month into the pandemic we did not have a lot of experience with virtual events and we kind of took a step back and said, I think that's more than we can manage to do and do well. So if you were with us then, you may remember that this time last year is when we kind of kicked off a series of standalone webinars. So um, those went well, gave us a little bit of uh, experience in the virtual events. And we wanna wholeheartedly thank those of you who supported those webinars um, because frankly, they gave us the experience to undertake a bigger event like this, but they also helped keep the organization afloat when we couldn't have face-to-face -face events. Uh, so the virtual events have gone well. They're the next best thing. We certainly wish we could be there with you in person. Uh, and we are planning our return to face-to-face -face events very soon. So hopefully you've seen that on the website, but we have a Looper Lifestyle coming up in Charleston in September, and then our fall rendezvous and a new winter rendezvous happening in October in Joe Wheeler State Park in Alabama and Fort Myers, Florida for the winter. But until then, we're doing it virtually. And um, as I said, we this is kind of the third big virtual event we've done. So we've kept the good parts and switched up some things based on the attendee feedback. Um, all of the sessions are being recorded with the exception of the social times, and that would basically be the small group discussions. And we chose not to record those because we want that to be an open dialogue and some people prefer not to be recorded. So we proceeded in that way. Um, but the seminars themselves are being recorded. So if you can't attend any particular session or your significant other is traveling and can't attend, you'll have the opportunity to catch up with those recordings. Um, so with that kind of baseline out of the way, I do want to take a moment and share a doc tale with everyone. So hopefully in your welcome bag, um, you have found your capable cruising doc tale. Um, I apologize to some of our Canadian members because they may not have arrived yet. We did ship them uh, 10 days ago, but I've heard from one or two of you that it has not gotten there. So regardless of whether you have your mango margarita from Capable Cruising or your other favorite beverage of choice. We hope that you'll join us in a toast 
And this is the toast that I first heard at a Looper Palooza event, but has become pretty common around there on the loop. So if you're not looping yet, you may not have heard this, or uh, you possibly can have this. Um, the here, so here's the toast you may have heard before. There are good ships, there are wood ships, and ships that sail the sea, but the best ships are friendships, and may they always be. And that fits very well with loopers. So cheers to all of you, and thank you for joining us. And I'll have a sip. And thank you to Karen at Scottsdale Capable Cruising for providing that top tail. So the agenda, real quick for tonight, we're going to start with the best of the loop presentation that I'm going to deliver for you. This kind of sets the baseline for the rest of the event. It tells you the basics of the route and some of the best things that you'll see on the way. We hope to have time for questions at the end of that. If you have questions during the session, the best thing to do is type them into the Q&A. We'll take questions from there at the end, time permitting. And at the end during the Q&A, if you do have questions, you can raise your hand and we can unmute your mic and you can ask those verbally. But we do ask that questions go into the Q&A. It makes it a lot easier for us to keep track of them. Um, the chat can be used if you're having technical difficulties. We do have some members of the home port crew monitoring that. But true questions for the speaker throughout the rendezvous should go in the Q&A. Once we finish here uh, with my presentation, we will move immediately into presenting the True North Harbor Host of the Year Award. And the recipient of that has been announced, of course, that is Beth and Rip Tyler. So we will uh, bring them on to accept their award. Then we'll break and you should all have a separate link for the second part of tonight, and that is your small groups. We need to switch from this Zoom webinar platform that we're in to a Zoom meeting. And there's some technical reasons behind that, um, but just bear with us when you join the meeting, you may see your group leader's name in front of your own name in Zoom. So right now you should see Kimberly Russo under my, my video. Yours may have your group leader's name. If you see that, do us a favor and just leave that where it is. That helps us get you to the proper group if the software doesn't automatically move you there as it should. Once you're in your group, you can uh, hover over that. You should see three dots by your name. If you tap the three dots, you'll be able to rename yourself to your actual name. So keep that all in mind, just a few housekeeping things. And with that, I am going to go ahead and start, start my screen share. Give me just one moment to do that. And all right. So as I said, we're going to talk about the best of the loop. Um, and I'm going to start really by just kind of going over some of the basics of the great loop itself. So um, I think I think you should all be able to see that now. Um, first of all, the biggest question everyone has about the Great Loop is what kind of a boat do I need? Um, basically, anything that is seaworthy enough to deal with some of the big water like the Gulf of Mexico, like some of the sounds and inlets along the East Coast, like the Great Lakes, as long as it can handle some waves and those types of waters, it's probably a suitable loop boat, but there are a few requirements that you do need to keep in mind. Um, the first one being the lowest fixed bridge on the Great Loop um, is currently charted at 19 and a half feet, roughly. You have that is the lowest bridge that there is no alternate way around. So you have to go under that bridge to do the Great Loop. So your boat obviously needs to be able to fit under that bridge. Get a lot of questions about whether or not a sailboat can do the loop based on that parameter. Yes, they can. They do have to unstep the mast in a few places, and I'll point those places out to you shortly. We recommend the, uh, that the boat draw no more than about six feet. That's kind of on the upper edge of it. Once you start to have a deeper keel than that, you will have some additional challenges. I'm not going to say you can't do the loop with a deeper keel because it has been done, but you're adding challenges getting in and out of marinas oftentimes. You will not be able to do certain canals like the Trent Severn Waterway. Uh, there they, uh, they maintain it to six feet, but they do require a waiver if you draw more than five. So uh, on places with high tidal swings, like here in Charleston, South Carolina, where the difference between high and low tide can sometimes be eight feet. Um, again, the, the more water, the more you draw, the more challenges you will have. So we definitely recommend not more than six feet, just to keep things a little bit simpler and easier for yourself really no practical restriction on length. Some people think that some of the canals or locks, particularly the historic ones, would limit the length of the boat. It's not necessarily the case. Most of the locks 
were built for commercial and military traffic. Um, so the only restriction I know of on length is actually, again, the Trent Severn, which is one of the more historic waterways. But the big chute, which you'll see more about tonight, is a specific kind of lock and its maximum length on a boat is 100 feet. So if you are bigger than 100 feet, which not too many looper boats are, um, you would need to take an alternate route. The Trent Severn would not be possible. And the same goes with beam. We get questions all the time about whether catamarans can do the loop. Absolutely, lots of them have. The Trent Severin has a beam restriction of 23 feet. So if your cat uh, is wider than that, then you would need to take an alternate route, but it is still possible. And then finally, uh, the current, uh, this slide says the current distance between fuel stops is 250 miles. It actually is more than that today as we speak. Um, that distance is typically uh, between um, Alton and Grafton area where the Mississippi and the Illinois waterway come together and Paducah, Kentucky, which is 250 miles. If you are out there right now headed in that direction in the next few days, Paducah has had to do some maintenance on their fuel dock and it is not currently open. We expect that to change in a few days. Um, the other good news is that Hoppies, which has kind of been a looper landmark for quite some time, and they have been without fuel for a couple of years now after some severe damage to their fuel dock from some flooding, they expect to be pumping fuel again in time for this season. Um, in fact, any day now, they do expect to be pumping fuel again, and that will cut that restriction. Um, the greatest distance between stops on the Great Loop at that point will um, be between Hoppies and Paducah. So uh, improvement there down to 200 miles from 250, um, which particularly for some of the gasoline powered boats is very much needed. So those are the boat requirements. And again, of course, seaworthiness. Some approximate stats for the Great Loop. At a minimum, it's about 5,250 miles. Of course, that is going to depend largely on your route choices and what side trips you take. And that's kind of the case for all of these stats. You'll go through 15 or more states and provinces, one or more countries. Um, right now, of course, with COVID, that's most likely going to be one. Um, although the Bahamas, uh, the, regu the regulations keep changing, but the Bahamas as a side trip may be possible, particularly as we get into 2022. And of course, we all hope that the Canadian US border will open sooner rather than later so our members on both sides of the border can continue their loop. But at this particular point in time, um, personal opinion, of it's not really looking good, particularly for the loopers in the US heading up the East Coast and getting ready to approach Canada in the next couple of months. Um, it's just not looking very likely, unfortunately, that it will be open in time. Perhaps the border will open in time for our Canadian members more towards um, August possibly September to enter through Georgian Bay and Lake Huron and continue, but that also is, is certainly questionable at this point. You will go through 100 or more locks, some of them very historic, and we'll show you a few of those today. We say 365 days plus or minus. That's kind of a more traditional seasonal approach to the loop. Um, it's very typical to want to be along the Great Lakes in the summer. Obviously, you don't want to be along the Great Lakes in the winter to spend the fall heading down the uh, inland rivers, reaching Florida and the Gulf of Mexico in the winter. Of course, that would be after hurricane season and you can enjoy the warm weather in Florida during the winter. And then heading up the East Coast around this time of the year in spring. That said, we really encourage you to do it in a way that speaks to you, in a way that makes it pleasurable to you. The loop has been done in as little as six weeks. Um, that's probably the record that I'm aware of. Um, and it's some members take many, many years before they complete the whole route because they're doing it in their own way and, and stopping in between different legs and segments. I do like to point out that it is a very high adventure, but still a very low risk undertaking. These numbers are all from 2019 because 2020 was such an unusual year that I didn't feel like it made much sense to attempt to update these numbers. Some of these events didn't even happen. But uh, 26,000 and change people uh, typically finish the Boston Marathon in a year. About 1,000 complete the full length of the Appalachian Trail each year. And that's about um, a third of the distance, I believe, of the Great Loop. It's about 2,000 miles. In 2019, 876 successfully reached the, Ever the summit of Mount Everest and 120 successfully swam the English Channel. Only about 150 boats complete the Great Loop in most years. In uh, 2019, it was 170. 
So um, it's still a very unique adventure. And keeping in mind, um, 2020 was a very strange year. We had a total, I believe, of about 100 and right around 100 completions in 2020. And as the calendar turned and we hit 2021 and loopers were on their way again, we really expected to start to see those loop completion announcements roll in. Well, we were wrong. And I think what it comes down to is that this time last year, people who were considering starting the loop and would be finishing around now tended, many of them didn't go, many of them postponed their trip. So we're sitting here in May of 2021. And so far we have had a total of three great loop completions reported this year. Um, that's extraordinarily low. Uh, I went back and looked at 2020. And at this time in 2020, we had had 41 completions reported. And I thought, well, maybe that's actually high for 2020 because for the first few months of the year, as things started to explode with the pandemic, loopers who were closing, closing in on crossing that wake may have just hurried and gotten, gotten home. Um, so I went back and looked at 2020 and in the first four, uh, first four months, January, February, March, April, in 2019, we had 31 wake crossings. Again, this year we have had three. So it's shaping up to be a very low completing year um, and another very unusual year, which I thought was actually just kind of fascinating. So I want to walk you through the waterways that make up the Great Loop because um, a lot of folks who are new to the idea of the Great Loop aren't quite sure exactly the waterways that run it. Um, so I'm starting from the Chesapeake, which is where we will be starting our route briefings starting on Thursday evening. Um, so you would take the Chesapeake to the C&D Canal, which connects you to the New Jersey uh, coastline here. Some loopers will take the intracoastal waterway in New Jersey, but many will go on the outside. And that is because the intracoastal waterway in New Jersey is not part of the federally maintained Atlantic intracoastal waterway. And it therefore um, is sometimes in desperate need of some dredging and some maintenance, and it often takes local knowledge on the intracoastal. So it's possible, and you'll see posts in our forum probably coming up in, in just the next week or so. Uh, with folks asking questions about that, but many will go on the outside here along the coast of New Jersey and tuck into any, uh, there, are, there are inlets you can tuck into for the night to anchor or tie up at a marina. From there, you will go to New York Harbor, continue on through the Hudson River, um, and at that point, you have one of your route choices. This, in most years, would be based on, partly on your, your air draft. Um, this year, of course, is different because currently loopers from the U.S. cannot cross into Canada. So the first choice is to take the Erie Canal. The western part of the Erie here has bridges that are just a little over 15 feet. So if you can clear those bridges, you'll take the Hudson to the Erie Canal, all the way to the western end of the Erie Canal and Lake Erie, and continue um, through Lake St. Clair and around Michigan to um, around Mackinac Island, where you would cross into Lake Michigan. If you cannot clear the 15 foot uh, clearance, for this year, or any year that you want to stay in the US, your choice is uh, to take the Erie Canal to the Oswego Canal, which is this kind of northwest little jug you see here. Um, that takes you to Lake Ontario. You will stay on the US side of Lake Ontario and end up here at the Welland Canal. You uh, And there's been, we just put a, an article about this in our Great Loop link that came out yesterday. There's details about this in the forum, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here. But you will have to, as a U.S. citizen, uh, make your boat a commercial vessel so that it becomes essential traffic um, to enter Canada. The Welland Canal, its its start and its end points are in Canada. Uh, so even if you are a uh, a licensed captain, you still need to hire somebody else to take your boat through so that it's a commercial transit and therefore essential travel. Um, you'll have to meet the boat on the other side and then continue through Lake Erie as the others, uh, as I mentioned before. In other years, if you can clear a 17 foot bridge, you can go this way into Canada. So through Lake Champlain, um, you'll end up on the St. Lawrence Seaway and come through some of the historic cities of Canada. And you can take this little side trip depending on your draft. I think you need about a four foot draft to do the um, Rideau Canal here. And then rejoin the route here around Kingston, which is a, in, in most years a more common way to do it. And then the third choice, um, if you can clear 19 feet, which again, there's a bridge outside of Chicago um, on the Illinois waterway around here that is charted at 19.6. So if that's about as low as you can get um, all of your gear, 
then you would take the Erie Canal to the Oswego, which is, is how I mentioned you would go to the Welland Canal this year. Um, but in other years, if you want to go into Canada, you would cross Lake Ontario to Kingston or directly into Trenton and prepare for the Trent Severn. We will be having route segments covered um, for all of these waterways I've been discussing. Um, since the majority of our attendees are planners, we are covering um, these routes into Canada. And then we've added a bonus session to go into more detail on what is typically the road less traveled, but this year will be a popular route through Lake Erie. Um, so you will we'll have a great coverage of uh, the Trent Severn of Georgian Bay, um, which crosses into Lake Huron and then continues on Lake Michigan. For this event, we will be covering the Wisconsin side of Lake Michigan. We had to make some really tough choices to fit in the content virtually. Um, everybody's attention span is a lot, lot shorter online. At an actual in-person rendezvous, we would have many more hours of route sessions, but we just couldn't fit it all in in this format. So we have chosen the Wisconsin side for this particular uh, webinar. If we have a lot of requests for the Michigan side, we may be able to do something a little bit further into the summer that'll cover the Michigan side. And that is where we'll stop the route briefing is at the end of Lake Michigan. Um, that's because if you attended the fall virtual rendezvous, we started in Chicago. But to complete the waterways of the Great Loop, you will um, leave Lake Michigan. You will, uh, there are two ways out of Lake Michigan. You, if you can clear about 17 feet, you can go through um, the Chicago River. And if not, you would take the Cal Sag, which is a little bit south of Chicago and takes you onto the Illinois Waterway. Either way, it gets you there. The bridge that is the low bridge is about here. You'll take the Illinois Waterway to the Mississippi River. Most loopers will not do the lower Mississippi. Uh, primarily because it is not very pleasure craft friendly. There are not a lot of fuel stops. There are not a lot of marinas for pleasure craft. It's a highly commercial waterway. So you'll be dealing with lots of barges and tows, which can make it more challenging and a little less pleasant to be boating. So most loopers will turn onto the Ohio River briefly and then continue onto the Tennessee River, which links to the Tom Bigby River, collectively known as the Ten Tom. That will put you out at Mobile, where the Lower Mississippi comes out in New Orleans. Instead, you'll be in Mobile at that point. You will head west, sorry, east, <laughs> and you will prepare for your Gulf crossing. You can either go straight across the Gulf or take the Big Bend route. Um, this Big Bend route is still pretty far out into the Gulf, so just keep that in mind. Some, some people tend to think that this is really almost an intracoastal or right along the shoreline, and it's not. This map is a little bit misleading. Um, once you get to the other side of the Gulf, you'll continue on the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway south, either cutting across the Okeechobee Waterway to reach the Atlantic Intracoastal or coming around through the Keys to reach the Atlantic Intracoastal. And then the Atlantic Intracoastal actually runs from Key West to Norfolk, Virginia, where our 2022 Spring Rendezvous will be held. So that's the route in a nutshell. Um, we once a year or so we pull our members to find out what they think is the best of the loop and i'm going to share some of those results with you now um, keeping in mind that we ask people to identify the best in a whole trip that's a year or more typically of bests so it's really hard to narrow down and, and focus in really on what the best of the best is um, so it's pretty hard to get consensus but i think we got a pretty reasonable consensus uh, but there were lots of surprises here um, based on what we learned in, in previous years. So let me do a quick check of the time and continuing with the best of the loop. First of all, the best big city, we're going to show you the top three in each category. The first is um, Ottawa. And of course, uh, our Canadian friends can enjoy cruising Ottawa this year. Our US uh, based friends cannot. But Ottawa is, of course, Canada's capital and has been since the 1850s. It's pretty common to be in this area around July 1st, which is Canada Day, so lots of fireworks and celebrations, so a great place to visit. There's also a, um, a flight lock in, in Ottawa. It's a, a flight of eight, so eight successive locks um, that you enter one into the other to change your elevation there on the waterway. The number two city uh, has previously been ranked number one. I'm not sure what caused it to fall to number two, but Chicago is always a looper favorite. Uh, marinas are really in the heart of the city or close to it. Of course, they're a little costly. There are also marina options further outside the city with great public transportation to get back to see all of the sites of Chicago. So that is number two. And I am proud to say that the number one big city 
was ranked as Charleston and uh, your Homeport crew is based out of Charleston. I will say that a lot of us would probably argue that Charleston is not really a big city. It's actually pretty small, um, but as compared to some of the very small towns on the loop, I can see why it was classified as big. So I know many of you are just coming through Charleston now and enjoying our beautiful historic city. Um, Charleston is also a huge foodie town. Um, and as things ramp back up from the pandemic, it has been pretty challenging for hospitality in Charleston to find employees. Um, so uh, you probably are experiencing some trouble getting into some of the restaurants. So if you're headed for Charleston, I absolutely recommend you make res reservations for your dining choices as far in advance as possible, which I know is a challenge when you're coming by boat and you're not 100% sure when you'll get here. Um, but lots of history here, including Fort Sumter, where the first shots of the Civil War were fired. Um, definitely look us up. We love to come out and visit members at the marinas in Charleston. It gives us a great opportunity in the spring to leave the office and come on out to the downtown area. So let us know when you're approaching here and we'll, we'll come meet you. Top small towns, number three, Mackinac Island. This, of course, is right where um, Lake Huron and Lake Michigan meet. It is an island um, with no uh, motorized vehicles, so you will find lots of bikes. You will find deliveries by horse and cart. Very quaint, unique island with uh, the Grand Hotel is there, which is a, a looper favorite for special occasions. Number two, Beaufort, South Carolina, which is just down the road from us here in Charleston. Very typical of the South Carolina and Georgia low country, and you can see that there in the picture. Beaufort has been uh, featured in the New York Times and has been named the best small southern town by Southern Living. Um, it's also a top 25 small city arts destination. So lots to see and do in Beaufort and it's a beautiful antebellum town. So definitely check out Beaufort on your way through. And the number one small city this time around was Charlevoix, Michigan. Uh, Charlevoix is just filled with quaint shops, some very unique architecture, including some mushroom houses that are a must see when you are on Lake Michigan and visiting Charlevoix. So make sure you, you do some of the architecture tours and art tours, very artsy, um, quaint town. We also asked for the best side trips. Um, the number three was Nashville, and we kind of named this the trendiest. Uh, we're seeing more and more loopers go to Nashville, and I think that is because Nashville has grown so much as a tourist destination in general. Um, it's a pretty short side trip up, up the Cumberland River, and it is typically fall when loopers are coming through this area, which means there's beautiful um, fall colors on the trees on the Cumberland, and it's just a lovely side trip with lots to see and do once you arrive in Nashville. Number two is the St. John's River. The St. John's River is in Florida. It runs from Jacksonville into Sanford, Florida, which is almost to Orlando. Um, this is a great side trip for our nature lovers. You are bound to see lots and lots of gators and also almost guarantee lots of manatee because lots of this river, um, there are natural springs that bubble up and keep the water at a constant temperature year round, which is what attracts the manatee and kind of makes it a haven for them. Um, so the St. John's River is certainly a side trip for all of our nature lovers. And then the top side trip was listed as the Bad River in Georgian Bay. And uh, we have pre-recorded our Georgian Bay uh, seminar for a few nights from now. We try to pre-record some of these so we can make sure we don't have technical issues and then have the speaker join us before and after for the live parts of the session. Um, and gosh, every time I see a presentation about Georgian Bay, including the Bad River, it just makes you want to go there immediately. So look forward to a great presentation on that. Moving on to some of the things you'll do. One of the quirkiest festivals that loopers have come across and continue to patronize is the Sputnik Festival. This takes place in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. One of the things you'll notice about the festivals, um, they tend to be at the time of year when loopers are in that part of the route based on that you know, traditional seasonal schedule. So um, the Sputnik Festival takes place, um, as I said, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. It's named after the Sputnik satellite, which was a Russian satellite. Um, part of it, the space debris from Sputnik, landed in the middle of the sidewalk in Manitowoc on September 5th, 1962. It was a 20-pound piece of debris. So the folks in Manitowoc said, well, what can we do? I know, let's make this a festival. Um, so they have a great marker there and, and every year on September 5th, they have a festival they name Miss Space Debris during the festival and that's part of what you see here in this picture. The number two festival is a fairly new one. It is the barbecue on the river and it takes place in Paducah, Kentucky. 
keep an eye on Paducah because you see it repeatedly in these best ofs. It's a pretty um, little known city, but they built this transient dock that you see here in this picture a few years back, and it really has helped to make it kind of a destination for loopers. So the barbecue on the river is a charity event. Um, they bring in lots of restaurants to see who cooks the best barbecue in the country. And it's the biggest crowd draw to downtown Paducah each year at this point. And the number one is the Blue Angels. We listed them at the Pensacola Naval Air, Naval Air Museum, which is their home base. But in most years, they also do a show at the um, Annapolis Commissioning Week for the U.S. Naval Academy graduation festivities. So this year, if you're headed that way, that happens to be May 26th, which also happens to be the date we just selected for an AGLCA Docktails and Looper Crawl event in St. Michael's just across the bay. So you can pick an AGLCA free event. You can go see the Blue Angels. Um, it's going to be a tough call, I think, um, but you can see the Blue Angels and that was rated as kind of the number one festival and their homecoming show is often in um, it is in Pensacola around the time of year that loopers typically get there. So something for sure to check out. Moving on to the top historic sites. Number three is a new entry to the list. It is um, the Muscle Shoals Recording Studio, which is not far from where we hold our fall rendezvous. Um, and Muscle Shoals is not far from Florence, Alabama. Give me a second to find my right page. Um, Many of you have probably seen a documentary about Muscle Shoals that was out a few years ago, and it's part of what really put this on the map. Um, but it's a, a historic recording studio where uh, groups and artists like the Rolling Stones, Aretha Franklin, Willie Nelson, Leonard Skinner, Bob Seger, Joe Cocker, Rod Stewart, it goes on and on, all recorded there at the Muscle Shoals recording studio. So there's a lot of history there, and that has become the number three historic site for loopers. Number two is the Shiloh National Battlefield. Um, it is now a national cemetery and it is in remembrance of the Battle of Shiloh. It was a two day battle in the Civil War where about 65,000 Union troops and 44,000 Confederates were, um, were fighting that two day battle. 24,000 wounded, killed, or missing in action at that very historic battle. It's right along the Tennessee River. Um, very somber, moving, but a must see stop for many loopers. And then the number one historic site was actually listed as the Trent Severn Waterway. Trent Severn is actually a national historic site for the country of Canada. Um, it is 250 miles long. Chad Buckner, who works for Parks Canada and is the director of the Trent Severn Waterway, is going to pre pre present about the Trent Severn during the rendezvous. And he is not to be missed. He's a fabulous presenter. He's come to the Norfolk Rendezvous several times in the last few years and been our top presenter. Um, there are 44 locks on the Trent Severn. They are numbered 1 through 45. Little fun fact, there is no longer a lock 29. So 1 through 45, missing 29 for a total of 44 locks. And moving on to museums. Number three, Paducah is back. The National Quilt Museum is in Paducah, Kentucky, and they literally have hundreds of thousands of people come to visit the Quilt Museum every year. I've heard from people who visited expecting to have a boring afternoon but were dragged there by significant others who rave about this quilt museum. The quilts are works of art. Um, we highly encourage you to check it out. Number two is the Antique Boat Museum in Clayton, New York, which is along Lake Ontario, Thousand Islands region. Stunning uh, area to visit and to cruise and of course to see the wooden boats at Clayton. And then the number one museum is the museum there at the Shiloh Battlefield, which we've already discussed. Moving on to favorite bridges. Number three, Charleston is back, the Ravenel Bridge here in our harbor. Um, it has a main bridge span of over 1,500 feet, making it the third largest cable stayed bridge in the Western Hemisphere. It is probably my best guess about 15 years old at this point, so it's a fairly recently built bridge. And it's got these iconic double diamonds that just make it beautiful there in our harbor. Number two bridges are the Chicago River bridges. Um, as I said, you need to be able to clear about 17 feet to do the Chicago River. There are 18 bridges in a span of two miles. They do not open um, because of the vast amount of car traffic in Chicago. They do open twice a year um, for, a, you know, like an afternoon for sailboats to get in and then back out. Those are the two times a year. So most loopers don't catch on those days. 
if you can't take your boat there, um, we encourage you to take one of the architectural tour boats. It really is a fascinating tour. Um, and again, if you can't clear the 17 foot bridges on the Chicago River, there is an alternate route called the Cal Sag that will take you to the Illinois Waterway so you can continue the loop. And then the number one, the infamous bridge, mile marker 300.5 to be specific on the Illinois Waterway. This is the lowest fixed point on the Great Loop, the lowest fixed bridge for which there is no alternate route. You must go under that bridge. Moving on to favorite locks. Uh, the, you'll notice all spilled beans here. All the top three are on the Trent Severin Waterway. As I mentioned, it's a national linear historic site um, for Canada. Lock number six um, is one of the locks that actually has shore power. And you can stay here, you can tie your up here overnight and enjoy power and, and the rest of the, the beautiful um, uh, lock station there. Um, the lock masters on the Trent Severn are amazing. Um, Chad Buckner has really fostered a lot of uh, camaraderie and hospitality there. And they have contests to see who can grow the best garden. Um, they've called us and asked us for looper swag to hang in their lock station so that they can welcome the loopers. They wanna hear your story. Fabulous bunch, mostly college kids who are working as lock masters for the summer. And I'm gonna show you the number two and the number one locks on the Great Loop are also on the Trent Severn. But this uh, lock number six um, is more typical of most of the locks on the Trent Severn. And even these are, um, the, the gates are on gears that are hand turned. So the lock masters and the law firm let you do this, have to put um, kind of a bar, um, a pole into a nut on the ground and walk in circles around which turns the gears and opens the, the lock as they're locking boats through. So really interesting historic thing to see. The number two lock is the Peterborough lift lock. Um, this is really an amazing piece of 100 year old technology. It was finished a little after 1900, I believe 1907, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, sorry, 1904. Um, the change in elevation here is 65 feet, so pretty substantial. And a few years ago when I visited here, um, Chad and uh, the lockmaster gave us a tour. Um, we actually got to stand under these uh, lock chambers as they were coming down, which was terrifying and fascinating all at the same time. Um, and I, we actually got to lock through some boats and I've seen pictures of other loopers here in the control tower here, locking through other boats as well. So really fun, fun stop. Be sure to tie up on the blue line, or not on the blue line, I'm sorry, tie up at the visitor center um, and just check out the operation first and then go to the blue line when you're ready to lock through. That's the indication that you are ready. Um, but this is all, uh, it's, it's all operated by the water power. Um, essentially, there are two um, caissons, almost like two giant bathtubs. They are 140 feet long and 33 feet wide, seven feet deep. When they are full, um, they hold about um, 228,000 gallons of water. So when one chamber is at the top and they're ready to lock through a boat, they flood the top chamber with about an extra foot of water which makes it heavier. The two chambers um, are on these pistons or ramrods. And then underneath the water here, the two ramrods are connected. So right now this chamber is down, this one's up, uh, and the valve is closed. They'll flood the top chamber with about another foot of water. They'll open the valve underneath and the weight of the upper chamber forces the water down through the cross pipe and then pushes up on the lower chamber so that they switch positions. Um, has worked like that since 1904, occasionally has a little breakdown. There was one a couple of years ago, but for the most part, continues to operate flawlessly. And here is a quick video. Um, I did a little time lapse on this just so that it would speed things up a little bit for the presentation. But this is, of course, the boat approaching the lock. And as you're on the loop, you are locking upward. So the boat enters the chamber at the bottom. And you can kind of see the structure here. Um, there are rumors that this is all haunted in here inside the structure. So we'll have to ask Chad about that if we have time when he's presenting. Um, 65 feet change in elevation, as I said, this happens in under two minutes. Now, I as I said, I, I uh, did a little time lapse here, but in real time, it's under two minutes. So if you've locked through a like a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers lock that's about the same height, you know, it takes much longer than that, even with more modern technology. Um, so the boat arrives at the top. They will open the gates. 
and the boat continues on its way. Beautiful view from up here. Even when you're not locking through, there are a set of stairs you can climb so that you can kind of uh, see the boats at the top and experience the view and see what it's all like. Great spot to take some pictures. Continuing on, the number one lock is the Big Chute Marine Railway. Um, the Big Chute was actually built in the, uh, finished in the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, 1978. It can carry boats up to 100 feet, uh, 24 feet for the beam. Um, there's a different lock on the Trent Severn that's more narrow than this one. I think there's one that's 23 feet. So this isn't gonna be your beam limiting lock. Um, but basically they call this the carriage. And the way this works is the carriage starts out submerged in the water. The boat drives up and um, is secured in place with those straps that you see. The cart then pulls the boat out of the water, drives on a track you can see here, up a hill, over an active roadway, and then down the other side and back into the water. It's a change in elevation of 60 feet. Of course, a big question on um, the construction of this is why would they do it that way rather than digging through or connecting the waterways in some other way? Um, the answer is it was an attempt to control invasive species that were migrating. So by not physically connecting the two waterways, um, they felt that they were better able to control those invasive species. So hence we have the number one lock on the Great Loop and that was rated as the Big Chute Marine Railway. And here is a time-lapse, I have to move something else out of the way. Here's a time-lapse video of the Big Chute. Oop, hang on, let's try that again. I think our video is having a little issue. There we go. So the card is submerged right now and the boat pulls up onto it. The straps are secured just to hold it in place. And the cart pulls it out of the water, across the road, and 60 feet down the hill, just like a big roller coaster, and drops it into the water. Once the cart is submerged again, the boat is able to float off and continue on its way. So that is the big chute. Moving on to favorite lighthouses, number three was the Elbow Key, um, the Elbow Reef Lighthouse. It is still an active lighthouse. It uh, sustained a lot of damage in Hurricane Dorian and is currently being fixed, um, but it's basically uh, was originally built in the 1800s, so um, a nice nod to the wonderful side trip of the Bahamas. Uh, the other two choices are a little bit unique. Um, all of the Michigan lighthouses were rated as the number two lighthouse. Um, there are a total of 102 lighthouses on Lake Michigan, all of them interesting and unique, and that was listed by our members as the number two lighthouse. And number one, something that a lot of folks won't necessarily consider a lighthouse, but when you think about it, the Torch of Lady Liberty absolutely is a light, and um, that was rated as the number one lighthouse along the Great Loop. Visiting the Statue of Liberty on your boat and taking a photo like this for another boat and exchanging them is, is really kind of a big moment for a lot of loopers. It's really a highlight for many um, to arrive there at the base of the statue in your boat. I've had members talk about um, how moving of a moment this is for many. One particular member described this um, as such, such a moving moment for him because his ancestors arrived in the US aboard the boat that carried Lady Liberty's torch. So lots of goosebump stories that I hear from members and lots of great photos coming from the Statue of Liberty. Loopers really like to eat. Um, so the top three restaurants, Gillies on Snug Harbor, that is in Georgian Bay, um, the freshest fish you can imagine as it's pulled in off the bay and served right there at Gillies. Number two, Patty's 1880s Settlement. They are famous for their two inch thick pork chop. Um, they had a uh, pretty devastating fire there a few years back, but have since reopened and are again serving their famous two inch pork chops. And then the number one restaurant selected by members is the Culinary Institute of America. This is in Hyde Park, New York. This is where some of the finest chefs in the country are trained. It is only about a mile away from a marina, so very easy transportation if you're arriving by water. They have several different restaurants that are operated from there as training grounds for the students. So lots of fabulous choices of food. And then to look at some of the favorite meals and dishes, um, Paducah, Kentucky is back. Doe's Eat Place was uh, rated, uh, it's filet, was rated as one of filet, uh, filet mignon one of the top meals on the Great Loop. So once again, Paducah, Kentucky, up and comer on the Great Loop. 
Number two are the soft-shelled crabs on Tangier Island. Um, beyond the, shell, the, the crabs, this is a very unique island. It is in the Chesapeake. Um, it was founded in the 1770s and has less than a thousand residents now, but uh, since 1850, the island's landmass has been reduced by uh, two thirds, by 67% because of the rising ocean levels. Um, so it's expected not to exist within the next 50 years. So it's definitely uh, something you should see now because the town will likely need to be abandoned if the sea levels continue to rise. And then the number one dish was that famous Patty's pork chop that I mentioned when I explained that Patty's was a top restaurant. Continuing on some of the best wildlife uh, sightings, you will see bald eagles in many places along the loop. And this is one of the finest photos I've received from members of the bald eagles. Number two, you will basically see gators all along the southern portion of the route. For the most part, they want nothing to do with you. They will hang out on, you'll see them on the riverbanks along the shores, just like you see this guy. Um, the biggest caution I can give you is that you should be cautious with the gators um, if you are walking dogs, particularly small dogs. Um, gators consider small dogs to be part of their spectrum of prey. Um, so here in South Carolina, that is something we are very cognizant of. And we would like for our loopers who are coming from other places and not as familiar with threats from gators to be cautious of that with your pets. And then of course, number one, dolphin. It just never gets old to see dolphin playing in your wake, leading you through the waterways. They like to follow the boats, play in the bow wake. Um, I'm told if you sing to them, they will often follow along much longer. Um, so really a sight to see. And then there are beautiful sunsets all over the Great Loop. Um, so it's hard to really rank them. So we're going to show you some of the sunsets along with some of what our gold loopers tell us is the best advice that they receive before starting their loop. Um, so the number three thing, if you don't use it at home, you won't use it aboard. We've had members who have taken all kinds of paper products and canned goods and things that they don't use at home, thinking that they may not be able to find the fresh foods or the things that they want along the way. You will see stores basically throughout the entire route. So if, if it's not something you use at home, you're not likely to use it aboard. So you might as well just leave it at home to start with. Number two, wait for better weather. Better weather. Um, and that is just good advice anytime you are cruising, but particularly on the Great Loop, if there is any question about whether it's a good weather day to cruise, um, a lot of boats go with the one veto rule. And that is if one person on the boat thinks that it's not a suitable day, the boat doesn't go. And I've had one member who said um, she would regularly tell her husband if she was not thinking it was a suitable day for cruising that her half of the boat was not going that day. Um, and that solves that pretty quickly. Um, and then the number one, fly your burgee. The burgee has been described as a welcome mat for loopers. It's been described as better than a puppy for meeting people. Um, it is the way that members identify each other on the waterway. And this of course is the white burgee for any member to fly. Once you have completed the whole route, you have earned the right to fly the gold burgee. And then we have a third color, which is platinum. And that is for anybody who has completed the route two or more times. Moving on to the best advice that our gold loopers said they have to give. One is to go now. You never know what's down the road. I've seen far too many people wait and wait and wait for the perfect time to go. And that perfect time just doesn't end up coming. And it, it you know passes them right by because they were waiting for the right time. Um, so once you've done your planning and your due diligence and you're ready to go um, from a boating skills and having a boat perspective, go now when you can. Uh, number two, take your time. There are fabulous things to see and do. And if you're on a schedule, we definitely recommend not having a schedule. The schedule is what will cause you to leave the dock on some of those weather days we mentioned that you're better off staying put. Um, and it can cause you to miss things along the way. If you're you know, dead set on being at a certain place at a certain time, um, you may miss a festival or an activity that's happening a few days uh, if you waited a few days longer. So take your time, um, but most of all, make it your own. There is no right or wrong way to do the Great Loop. So don't let someone else dictate how fast you do it or what kind of boat you have or where you stop. Um, really do the research to make it your own trip and find the things that will bring you joy along the way so that it becomes the unforgettable adventure of a lifetime that it really should be for all of you. And with that, I will just check the time and we've got about 10 minutes for questions, which is more than I usually have. So I apologize if I sped through that too much. Um, 
So I will start with the Q&A, but if anyone does have any questions, um, I'm going to stop the screen share because I don't think we really need that in our way. And if anybody has any uh, questions that would like to raise their hand, please feel free to do that. Um, and I can call on you live, but for now, since I don't see any hands yet, I'm going to take questions from the written Q&A. So the first one, Patty asked, what are the restrictions related to hurricane season and getting into the Gulf? That is going to absolutely be based on your own comfort level and primarily on your hurricane or your marine insurance. Some insurance, play, uh, insurance carriers have restrictions on how far south you can go between what period of time. So typically, if you do have that clause, as you're coming down the river system, it's typically November 1st that they don't want you to go past northern Alabama. You can enter Alabama, um, but typically not too much further south than like Demopolis. So somewhere on the 10 Tom is probably where you have to stop. Um, so if you're running ahead of that, you probably want to plan ahead and stop somewhere where there's more things to do, which is partly why Nashville um, is this popular side trip and partly by why Chattanooga is as well. Um, Let's see, also from Patty, they plan on leaving Nashville October 1st of this year or sooner. Should they anticipate any difficulty with reserving slips at Marine is due to heavier loop traffic? I would say no. Um, the number of, of boats in our database that say they're in progress is not significantly more than other years. The number of boats that asked to be included on our Great Loop fleet of 2021 shirt is not that much more than it has been in previous years. Um, most of the marinas do have the capacity. I rarely come across a member who can't get into a marina when they want to. Occasionally their first choice of a marina in a particular town may not be available, um, but typically there is dockage available. The exception to that is going to be if you plan to stay in South Florida for an extended period of time in the winter, like if you're looking for a monthly slip, um, it is already a little bit late for that for this coming winter in South Florida. So definitely get on some waiting lists there as soon as you can. Um, I am gonna take, we've got a couple more written questions, but I am gonna take a, um, a raised hand. So Paul Goss has his hand raised. So I am going to see if I can get you unmuted here, Paul. Give me one second to, there we go. Paul, you should be unmuted. You may have to unmute on your end, but you should be able to go ahead and uh, unmute and ask your question. Yes, um, I'm one of those unusual persons who does schedule, but um, I'm I'm using the um, Looper's Companion Guide as sort of a stalking horse, following through the day-to-day -day, um, itinerary that Captain John recommends. Mm -hmm. And my only puzzle about it was going up the eastern shore of Michigan on Lake Huron, he has lots of days with only 20 miles between stops. And I just wonder, reading between the lines, if there's anything about that shore that I'm uh, missing, because to me, it doesn't look as though there's any particular reason for those legs to be shorter than 40 or 50 miles a day. So just curious. Yeah, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why um, Captain John set yeah. it up that way. Um, not sure what his thinking behind that was. Um, we will be having a seminar that's, um, it, it's kind of an add on to the spring rendezvous and it is free to anybody who's attending the spring rendezvous, but it is three weeks from tonight, if I'm not mistaken, um, the 25th of May. Um, and it will cover that territory. So the speakers for that are, um, the Wilsons, and I'm sure that they have different recommendations or perhaps similar, but they can at least tell you why that's the recommendation. So I would definitely suggest asking that question at that seminar in a few weeks. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, let's take another live question. Um, Jib Davidson is next. So uh, Jib, you should be able to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me? Is this working? Yep, I can hear you. All right, my, my only question is, what is the best source of travel information? Is it the web or is it the guidebooks or what, what's your guidance on that? Everybody's opinion is different. You know, everybody likes information in different formats. So I really recommend you kind of experimenting a little bit and finding what works for you. Um, waterway guides are really a very thorough resource that a lot of cruisers really do enjoy. Um, 
some of the crowdsourced information and Waterway Guide does have a crowdsourced um, platform through their app and through their website that you can get some even more current information. That's what's in the guidebooks. Um, yeah. But most, most do like to combine that with um, some general travel information. Really? You know, so it's a combination of the marine travel information that you'll get from your chart plotter and from the guidebooks and some general information from the web is what I would say that most use. But again, it's very much a personal preference thing about how people you know, like to read and absorb information and everybody's just a little different on that. All right, I'm gonna go back to the Q and A. Um, uh, what is the name of the island you mentioned for soft shelled crabs? That's coming from Phil. Um, Phil, that was Tangier Island in the Chesapeake. So that was an easy one. Um, next question, when does the Erie Canal open? Gosh, great question. Um, we, I believe have put that out there. So uh, home port crew, um, Julie, if you could check, I think that's been in the forum. I want to say it's May 17th this year, but I could be off. So let's see if we can dig up that answer while we're answering some of these other questions and then come back to it. Um, question from Jim, if we do Maine, are there harbor hosts to assist? Absolutely, lots of harbor hosts in Maine. In fact, there are harbor hosts all along the route all the way up to Maine. Um, and several of them contributed to the Great Loop Link E magazine. Uh, that's our monthly magazine. It went out yesterday with an article, part one about cruising to Maine, um, written primarily by three of our harbor hosts that take you along that route. And then we'll, we'll pick up where they left off and finish that up next month. Um, you can find harbor hosts. The easiest way to find them geographically is to go to the greatloop.org website, go to the about the route menu and click on the Great Loop interactive map. The ring buoy icons or markers for harbor host, and there are about 500 of them now around the route. Uh, let's see. I'm going to take another live question because the ones um, we are going to start to run short out of time. We're going to start to run short of time, and some of you that type them in the Q and A, I can always answer those afterwards. Um, typing them and get those out later. So I'm going to go to a couple of live ones. Um, Daniel Block, go ahead and ask your question. Just, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the big chute marine railway, mm -hmm. rail, is, are those straps adjustable? <laughs> it just, they do. Yeah, they adjust. They you know, there, they don't line up, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, your boat is not suspended by them. It's just kind of supported by them. Um, but the lockmasters there are not the college kids who are just working for the summer. They are professionals that um, really study the new boat designs. They, they actually send them to boat shows to study those and they have a, a database and sources inside their lock station to study um, boats they may not be familiar with so that if a boat comes in, they can make sure that they're uh, strapping it appropriately and uh, correctly. Um, of course, if you do have pod drives or something along that line, it never hurts to kind of uh, point out any kind of gear that you have like that, that you're gonna wanna make sure they know about. But yeah, the straps are absolutely adjusted. Oh, cool. I, I have tags on the side, so mm -hmm. all I got to do is line it up with that. I was worried they were just random. <laughs> nope, not random, actually. Very well um, thought out and very well trained folks that are doing that there. So thank you for that question, though. Great question. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Matthew Smith. Matthew, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I was wondering if there are going to be other kids on the boat, on the loop. And you're not Matthew Smith. I'm not Matthew Smith by his daughter. <laughs> I could tell by your voice that you weren't Matthew. Um, we have more and more kids on the loop. Um, if you are a family, the small group that you've been assigned for later this evening will be led by the Wilsons and the Steins. They are our family ambassadors. They are both families um, that did the loop a few years ago, but continue to live aboard. Um, there are several other families out there right now. I think the total group of families um, I think there are about seven of you who have seven families who have joined the spring rendezvous and are all in the same small group with the Steins and the Wilsons leading. So you should meet those other families in uh, just about a half an hour. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, and let's go to Ted Staley. Hey, Ted. Good evening. Hi there. New York Canal is open May 21st. Thank you so much, Ted. Uh, for those of you who don't know Ted, um, Ted is a gold looper. He is one of the editors of Waterway Guide. Um, so May 21st is the New York State Canals, not just the Erie, but all of them. 
for most loopers this year, the only one that's going to matter is the Erie, because if you try to take the Champlain Canal, you'll be heading for Canada. Um, but a waterway guide is, of course, an admiral sponsor of AGLCA, and we are thankful for Ted's support during this <laughs> to tell us when the canal's open and at other times as well. So thanks, Ted. All right, a few more questions that we have time for. Um, is a side trip from Mobile, Alabama to New Orleans, Louisiana practical? So Roger, I would, it's possible. Practical is a little bit of, you know, that's a questionable, that's hard to answer if it's practical. Um, there was a discussion, I want to say not too long ago in the uh, discussion forum about this. So I would definitely try searching there or asking there. Um, it's not a real common side trip. Um, most loopers, I would say, who do it, do it because they're coming from, like, let's say, Houston to start the loop. So they're coming the other way through there and then eventually going back to Houston. So there are definitely folks that do it that could give you some information. I just don't have that handy because it's not a real common um, side trip. Let's take one more um, live question from Craig. Craig Esper, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask me your question. Craig, I'm not hearing you yet. It looks like you're still muted on your end. Oh, is that there better? You. Yep, we've got you. Go ahead. Um, we're leaving Cape Vincent, New York, um, July, July 15th. Uh, what do you think about that time, uh, about starting down? And we're going to be going down through the Erie. Tell me where that is in New York. Cape Vincent. We're right uh, where the Lake, Lake Ontario meets the St. Lawrence River. Okay, so you're going to head down through the Champlain and then into the Erie? No, we're going to head down the Erie, um, actually the Oswego uh, Canal, then yeah, yeah. We're going to, yeah, then we'll come over the west side of the Erie, then down, or west side of uh, the Erie Canal, then down to Erie Lake. Gotcha, yeah, sorry for that, sorry about that, yeah, completely understand now. Um, you said July 15th? Yes. So it's certainly doable. It's probably a little bit later than some loopers would typically be coming through that area. But given that you're not going to Canada, um, it's a very doable time frame. Really, the, the hindrance there, so to speak, is that you're going to want to get all the way through the canal, through Lake Erie, through Lake Huron, and down Lake Michigan before the cold weather starts to set in, the facilities start to close. Um, and the weather days on Lake Michigan get worse as the fall continues. So your limiting factor there is that you probably want to be to Chicago sometime in September, usually not much later than that. Occasionally that's different because there's lot closures and things like that, but it's typical to arrive in Chicago somewhere around September. Once you get into October and particularly late October, the facilities on the Great Lakes are closed. The weather gets miserable. So, you know, depending on how much time you plan to spend in each port, um, it certainly is doable to leave from where you're talking about in mid-July and head that way on the route, particularly since you're not going through Canada. So hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're very welcome. We're going to have to hold it there. Just one quick comment. Um, Dave Fuller, who's one of our gold loopers and um, one of our presenters, mentioned that the short runs on um, Lake Huron are because there's just a lot of uh, many neat small towns to stop and see. So um, that's why Dave is, is uh, suggesting that Captain John uh, set it up the way he did. Um, so I'm just taking a quick look at the other questions that we have in the Q&A, and we are out of time. So I'm going to answer those typing wise <laughs> and then send those out to everyone. So I apologize that we're out of time for that, but we will get you the information. Mm -hmm.